preach it 10 more if the Lord allows and I live that long. I don't know. But I think about these other two parables here in Luke chapter 15. And I want to share with you a few things of where we have missed and we have lost our focus. Chapter 15, and I'm where we read to begin, that's where we'll be. It says, Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Let me tell you the first thing. The first problem is this. There's a callousness of the hearts of the people. That's what's wrong with the scribes and Pharisees. Their hearts are callous. You know how I know? They didn't want Jesus to go out and eat with sinners, tax collectors, the poor, the needy. They didn't want him to do that. You know what they wanted? They wanted to be real comfortable to Jesus to sit right next to them the whole time. And if people didn't look like them, they didn't want Jesus to be a part of it. I'll tell you this, I'm thankful that Jesus came for another reason than what the scribes and Pharisees thought. Because you know what? I'm one of those people that probably if someone would have said, why is he talking to him? Look at his lifestyle. He's got to, the Lord's got to know he's dirty, he's unclean, full of sin, all those things, by the way, times ten. I'm thankful that Jesus came for people like me. You know what? It's the callousness of the hearts. They're more concerned about themselves. In fact, they're upset. It says they begin to grumble. This man receives sinners and eats with them. You know what they're saying? Let's, let's paraphrase that. How dare him go and hang with those people? You know what they miss? Those are the very people he came to hang out with. The only difference between the scribes and Pharisees and those people that they didn't want him to be with was the realization they didn't know that they were lost. These other people knew that they were. They thought they were righteous enough in their own self-righteousness. They didn't need a Savior. And the truth is, they needed the blood of Jesus just like everybody else. And I'm going to tell you something. We forget sometimes that the very reason we're here is to reach out to people who are just like we were. We forgot it. We forgot it. Because every time we want to fix a problem, it doesn't include going out and reaching those people who need Christ. You know how you fix a budget? I'll tell you how you fix a budget. You reach people for Jesus. They get on fire for God. They begin to give in a way that God is glorified. And we have excesses of budgets. We don't worry about budgets because people are coming to know Jesus Christ. You know how you fix a fellowship problem? People come to know Jesus Christ. They get on fire. They get excited. It gets contagious. And it spills over to this person this person. Before you know it, the fellowship's better than it's ever been. You know why? Because revival has broke out and people have come to know Jesus Christ. We're missing it. If we want to be obedient to what God wants us to do, we need to quit looking in the mirror and say, God, what can I do for me? And I need to look out and say, what can I do, Lord, for the glory of the kingdom of God? Go out and share. I'm telling you, I think about it, and I think about the people who had the nerve, and I mean nerve and the courage. What I mean by that is the courage and the strength to say, hey, I want to share it with Ronnie. He's lost. He's living in sin. He's bound for hell apart from somebody telling him about the good news of Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful? Well, their hearts are calloused because they're more concerned about Jesus hanging around with them. They didn't like the fact he was going and hanging around with others. The second thing we see, not only do we see the callousness of the people, but we see the compassion of Christ. The compassion that God desires, not only of his own, but for us. He said in verse 3, so he told them a pair of following. He knows they're grumbling. He knows what's going on in their hearts. He knows they're upset. And he knows they're calloused. He says, what man among you, verse 4, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder, lays it on his shoulders, excuse me, on his shoulders, rejoicing. But look at verse four. He says, What man among you, if he had a hundred sheep and lost one, he wouldn't leave the rest and go find the one? You know what he's saying? 
He said, if you had a pasture full of sheep and one of them got lost, what would you do? You'd run out and find them. You'd lurk, look and you'd search and you'd scratch. You'd all turn every bush and you'd go in every corner and every crevice and every rock. You'd go every field. You'd go everywhere you could to find it until it was found and saved. The next part in verse 8 talks about a woman and a coin. It says, or what woman? If she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And it talks about when she finds it, the rejoicing that comes. We'll talk about that in a minute. But look at both of these. And here's what we understand from both of these parables. Both owners lost something, whether it be the shepherd and the one sheep, or it be the woman and the one coin. Both of them lost something. You ever lost something? I'll tell you what aggravates me. I can't find my favorite Bible. I got them all over the place. I probably got one nearly in every room, but I'm looking for one. And I'm not going to go to bed and go to sleep until I find it. It agitates me. I am OCD. I understand all that. But I'm looking for them. And Lisa might say, hey, you got three right there. I don't want those three. I want this one. I know what she's thinking. How have I tolerated it this long? Thank you, Lord. And I say, I want to find them. And it's nothing for me to get dressed, put shoes on, go out in the Jeep and say, let me find it. It's midnight. But I want to find it. I'm looking for it. And here's the thing. I won't be, I won't settle, I won't be satisfied until I get it. So when are you going to read again? I'm not just reading one verse. I don't know. I'm nuts like that. But the deal is I want it. I've lost it and I want it back. You ever, you ever like that for anything? Yeah, you got whatever. It can be lots of things. It can be a pair of socks for all I know. But I'm looking for it. And I'm not going to settle until I find it. But you know what? We ought to have that same desire for that lost person. That's right. You say, I've shared with him 15 times. You may take 15 more. Here's the deal. I'm not concerned if I lead them to Christ or someone else does. What I'm concerned is they come to Christ. Maybe it took 15 for me where God would use, not that I did it, but God used that just to soften the heart enough for the next person who walked in the first time they've ever shared with them and they said yes to Jesus. But you know what? I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to quit and that's the thing about the people in the, in the parable. The shepherd, he went out, he says in verse 5, when he has found it. Or actually, in verse 4, before we get that far, he says, he goes into the open pasture, leaves the 99 in the open pasture, and goes after the one which is lost until he finds it. In other words, he's doing all he can to find it. I love the story with the lady and the coin, the woman and the coin better than anything, because here's what she does. He says, when she loses, she has ten silver coins and loses one. She light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it. I'm going to tell you something. You ever try to find something in the dark? It's not easy. In fact, it's about useless. Anything I find in the dark, I trip over and I'm not looking for it. Amen? I found many things like that. And I was hollering at the kids because they left it there later. But she lights a lamp. She sweeps the floor. She does whatever it takes, and she's not going to rest until she finds the coin. Why are they looking for the coin and the sheep? It's real simple. Because they're valuable to them. They're valuable to them. Let me tell you something. Does God put any more value on anyone than a lost soul? I'll answer that for you. No, he does not. You say, how do you know that? Because Jesus died for that very reason. They lose something and they don't rest until they find it. Church, all of us. You want to watch God do a miracle in His building amongst His people? Let's start reaching lost people. Let's start praying and sharing without rest and watch God show up and do what He does. Because I tell you what God is, He's always faithful. 
and hearts will be saved, lives will be changed, and God's people will get on their face, on their knees, and on their feet up doing what God has actually called us to do. But that's what he's called us to do. Now, he's not saying these other things are not important. We talk about, <clears throat> when I started this, about scripture memorization, giving, serving. I understand all that's important. That's a part of it. But I'm telling you, when we focus on those things and not the salvation of others, our focus has went from looking out to looking in. And that's when the church becomes stagnant and even worse, dead. That's what happened. Look at Southern Baptist Convention. Y'all have seen the stats, number of baptisms, and I don't realize it's not about baptism, but it's a reflection of confessions of faith in Christ. Y'all know that. It's declined for the last few years. Why? I'm convinced because we're more concerned about other things than reaching a lost world. All of us. But they go, they do whatever they need to do. She lights the lamp, she gets the broom out, and here's the thing. I was reading a book this week, and here's what really hit me. The preacher says this. He said, The goal of the church is not to maintain ministries, but to reach the lost and disciple. What you think about it? He said, The goal of the church is not to maintain ministries. So we say, Oh, we got all these kind of ministries. He said, Here's our goal. He said, The goal is to reach the lost people and to disciple. And he said, what we've decided to do, and he said, it was met with much resistance, by the way, and I can imagine. He said, every year we evaluate these ministries. If they're not discipling people or reaching people for Jesus, we cut them. Cut them out. He said, one of the, most, he said, one of the things I did that, that caused the most controversy, he said, they have a breakfast a year after year for a group of people in town. And he said, it was a breakfast. It's just what they always did. He said, we got to looking at it. He said, it was one of the biggest budget strains all year. He said, we looked at it and we said, is anybody being reached to that? Any discipleship being done? And for the last 15 years, no. I said, no, it's just a fellowship. He said, we're going to cut it. He said, people wanted to run me out of town. He said, look at me, and he said, elders came up, and he said, hey, preacher, he said, you're ruining this church. Why don't you go ruin somebody else's church? And finally, the elders, one of the, one of the other elders, looked at the other guy, and he said, hey, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, if you've got a complaint that has something to do with Scripture, let me know if it doesn't. He said, either sit back and let God do what he's going to do or find somewhere else to serve. And since then, their growth has doubled and tripled. Not because of this one event, but because he said, you know what we've realized? Man, we're doing stuff because that's what we've always done. He said, they're not reaching people for Christ. We're not attempting to. Or the disciple, he said, we're not doing it anymore. Think about it. And here's a question I ask myself. Why am I even here? Why am I here? It's a question I wrote down this week. Why am I here, first of all? On this earth, I'm talking about right here. And the second thing is that I really desire to serve God the way I should. And if I do, what am I going to do about it? It's the kind of questions I'm writing down and, and filling out myself. I want to tell you something. We all ought to do that. Why are we here? Why are we here? Do I desire to serve? And if so, why? Why are we serving? Not because somebody asked us to, I pray. That's not the answer. But because of what Jesus did, and I'm here to seek out and to share with those. I know I can't take them, but I can share with those who are lost. I know God does the saving. I know that. And the Holy Spirit draws them. I know that. But he also sends out his people to do the work through Compassion. Compassion calls them to do something. The value of what was lost calls them to do something. And let me share with you the last thing. There's a celebration that takes place. He said in 15.6, And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. So here comes the guy home. Here he comes. He's lost one sheep. He's got 99. I mean, think about it. It's just a round number, by the way. It's a parable. But he's got 99. And so, why is, that, why is he that concerned? I'll tell you why. Because every one of them is just as important as the other one. The bag. But think about this. He's got 99 back home. Should he be that excited? Yeah, he's that excited. 
he puts it on his shoulders. And he comes home and tells his friends and neighbors, look, I found it. I found it. If you've ever had a chance to share Christ with someone, or, let me take it back. If you've ever taken the chance, we have chances all the time. If you've ever taken the chance to share Christ with someone, and someone said yes to Jesus, no, nah, I'm not going to put them on the shoulders. Most of the time they're too heavy. But the thing is this. I can't wait to come and tell somebody else. I can't tell you how many times we've been in that office and someone said yes to Christ. And as soon as we walk out, someone comes up and I say, Kevin, come here. Let me, let me let you meet our new brother in Christ. He just prayed to give his heart to Jesus. I'll just use Kevin's example. But if he's the one in that office, he's the first one that's going to get it. And I walk a little further than that foyer. Here comes someone else. Here comes the Lord. He says, Lord, meet your brother in Christ. He just said yes to Jesus. You know why I do it? Because I'm excited about it. Because there is value. You know why I know there's value? Jesus shed his blood for that one soul that he might come to him. That's why I'm excited. I get excited about lots of things. I'm excited. We've got a baptism here in a few minutes, and we're going to celebrate. Amen. Amen. But i got news for us. Celebration has been going on ever since Sierra said yes to Jesus. Heaven's been rejoicing for a long time. <coughs> for days. And I pray that we're doing the same. Amen? Amen? You know, get us excited about it. But yet, here's the celebration that comes. He comes back. He said, I found my sheep, which was lost. And look what Jesus said. I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. You know what Jesus said in a nutshell? You want to see a real celebration in heaven? It's not for this other stuff we've been talking about. It's when someone says yes to Jesus. You want to hear a celebration from heaven? You want to see all the angels rejoice? This, by the way, it talks about here in the next parable. You want to hear the angels rejoice? When someone says yes to Jesus, we praise to surrender our heart to Jesus Christ, all heaven begins to rejoice. So, when we think about Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost, when we use the term Christian and we're tagged with that, it means to be Christ-like. And that will be a challenge to all of us, me included, every one of us, to ask the question, how often am I seeking out those who are lost? I'm going to tell you something. It's easy to get out of the pity party when I take my focus off of Ronnie and I start sharing Christ with someone else. You won't get out of that muck and that mire? I've been in it, trust me. You won't get out of it? Take your focus on your circumstance. Look at someone else's destiny. You say, how do you know they're desperate? I'll tell you why. Because they're one breath from eternity in hell unless they know Jesus Christ. The scripture talks about that sheep wandering away. It's almost the implication of a desert land. In other words, a destitute place. They're going to die if they stay out there. Guess what? So is a world going to die without Christ if we don't reach them. That's where they are. Every one of them. You know how I know? I was there. And so are you if you're a child of God today. Two things. You either have been there, or if you don't know Jesus Christ today, you are currently there. But I'm going to tell you some good news in a minute how to be removed from that. The woman says she found the coin. Verse 9. She found it. She calls together her friends and neighbors. What's the first thing she do? does? That's nice English. What's she do? What's she going to do? Yeah, in case y'all don't know, you got a goofball for a preacher today. If you're missing, I apologize. Anyway, here's what she do right here. Verse 9. Mm, make sure we play this on the radio, can we? Anyhow, verse 9. When she had, by the way, if you can't laugh at yourself, who can you laugh at? I mean, here's why I look at everybody else been laughing at you for a long time. You might as well join on in. <laughs> When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. You know what she does as she finds the coin? She calls the friends and neighbors and says, Let me tell you how excited I am. That coin that I'm missing, I found it. I don't know about you, but I can't afford to lose to me, coins. Amen? Yeah. I guarantee you, you think I'm looking for that Bible? I'm looking for that dollar, too, if it falls out somewhere. Just tell you the truth. Y'all know it. She finds it. She's excited. Joy. Why? Because of the value. Because of the importance of it. And 
I know it's a parable, and here's what Jesus is saying. What is the most important thing? To go out and to reach those who are lost. Those who the ones that Jesus died for. And here you have scribes and Pharisees and their self-righteous self and callous hearts grumbling and complaining because Jesus is doing exactly what he said he had come to do. And then the last part, verse 10, in the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Last thing it says in the, in the last verse of what we're reading anyway, the first ten verses. In the same way, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You know who he's talking about? Lost people who come to know Jesus. That's who he's talking about. As people debate that, they're always talking about this. He's talking about people who are lost. That's why he used the word lost. He's talking about people who are lost, one breath away from the eternal hell, who have no hope, they live in despair, they have no joy, no peace, and they're found, and all that has been removed and replaced with a life they could have never imagined through Jesus Christ. And that's why all of heaven, the angels of God, all the heavenly hosts, stand and rejoice when someone says yes to the King. What an awesome sight. You know, I think about Revelation. We studied that a while back, whenever it was, last year. And we got and we got talking about the heavenly host and the shouting, uh, glory, glory, glory is the Lord God Almighty. All that. Remember all those pictures of heaven? I know we can't completely picture it now, but I think about that. You know what else? That reminds me. Can you imagine that celebration going on? Guess when it happened? It happened the day I prayed and gave my heart to Jesus. You know what else? As a child of God, it happened the day you prayed and gave your heart to Jesus. And it happens every time. A, re a sinner repents and surrenders to Christ. Look, this is a wake-up call for me as well as anybody. But I'm here to tell you, the problem with the church, I'm talking about as a whole today, is this. Our focus has been on us. What's good for me? Will it make me feel better? Will it make things better for me? When the truth is, our focus ought to be on those who are lost. If we're going to follow Christ's example, and by the way, that is the example to follow. It's real simple. Seek out those who are lost. And this is the last thing I'm going to share. I might have already said that already, but this is the last thing I'm going to share. Here's the best news of all. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, let me tell you how you can. Romans chapter 10 tells us, we can look at other passages, but Romans chapter 10 is clear as it can be. You confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. He also says in verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, that means you, that means me, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love that part. You know what he's saying? That's everybody. Doesn't matter where you've been, where you are. It's all about will you surrender to him today. He'll save you. In fact, he came to save you. That's why he did it. And so it's just a matter of you saying, Lord God, I've messed this up big time. I've got sin in my life. Lord, I ask you to forgive me. I repent of my sin. I want Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior of my life, and I completely surrender to him. I believe that he's your son, God, and I believe on the third day he arose from the grave and he conquered death, hell, sin, and the grave. And I want him to be my Lord and Savior. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, save me. It don't have to be in that order, but it has to be those exact words. It's about you acknowledging your sinfulness, and surrendering to his lordship in your life. That's what it's about. And you know the best news of all that? The moment you do it, all heaven just broke out rejoicing because you just became a child of God. Church, let us repent from when we have lost our focus 
and let us focus on what Jesus would have us to do and to reach those who are lost and in need of the one and only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads with me?